Hi, I'm Misha here. And there's no great goal or purpose behind this video. I just had a table full of infield number four Mark 1's laid out. I thought, eh, we haven't talked about infields in a little while. So why not? These are all chambered for 303, of course. We have a few different variations. Kind of going in reverse order. At the bottom, we have a number 4 Mark 2. Or rather, a number 4 Mark 1 slash 2. One of the final iterations. Then in the middle, we have two British wartime examples. And at the top, we have a Canadian long branch. Number four, Mark One Star. Brief recap the number four was really the last major pattern in the very long lived Lee Enfield family. Of course, you have the number five jungle carbine and some other things like the 2A1 from Ishapur. But this was kind of the last major change. You know, you had the original Lee Medford, then the Lee Enfield, then the SMLE, and then this. And the number four is a post-World War One. Honestly, a project that took 20 years. The idea was to make the infield cheaper, faster, more efficient to mass produce, giving it better sights, and hopefully better inherent accuracy as well. They did not want to sacrifice its pretty famous quick action, you know, quick operating turn down bolt. So they kept that pretty much the same. The receiver itself was kind of squared off. This was done mostly to cheapen speed up production. But some say it was a little sturdier. Also the uh, stripper clip guide was more integrated as a single piece. The barrel is a, a tad longer, 25 inches and some change, and it sticks out a couple of inches from the muzzle now. It's mostly free-floated. It does make contact on the end here, but inside here it's pretty much just running. It's also a heavier barrel, but on the flip side it uses a smaller, lighter bayonet, be it a blade or a spike pig sticker. It still uses the traditional 10 round magazine, although it's slightly shaped differently. Same goes for the buttstock. Same basic infield pattern, still has a trapdoor in the stock, but the wrist is thicker and a little more squared off, making it a little more durable. Also, again, kind of faster, easier to machine. This would really kind of, well, its ancestor would be the SMLE Mark V, which would lead to the number one Mark VI. But a thousand would be produced in 3031. They would basically have very extended troop trials with those. They would finally put the number four Mark I into production in late 1939. However, it would not be until February of 1941, so quite a ways into World War II. 
that this would be officially adopted. And it would be put into production at several factories. In England you had BSA Shirley, Maltby, and Fezakerly. And then in North America you would have Long Branch in Canada and Savage in the US of A. It's worth pointing out that Australia and India opted to continue manufacturing the number one Mark III. So early on in World War II, this was not very common in Britain, but when you get to the second half of the war, this appeared more and more. And it really was a more accurate rifle. It was a little heavier, but, you know, one of its biggest claims was we have this peep sight mounted on the receiver, very adjustable. Then we go all the way out here for our front sight, which is drift adjustable and it's protected. So you have better sights with a longer sight radius. This combined with the heavier and semi free floated barrel really helped. Well, you know, as the war went on, they did have to make economies. In Britain, a version like this here, the milled sight would give way to a stamped adjustable sight. There are a couple of different versions of this, but you get the idea. There's one where this doesn't stick out, it's more folded in. But they went to a stamped adjustable sight. They also would go to kind of an alloy butt plate, cheaper metal. And they would start using stamped parts. For example, some of the barrel bands would be made of stamping. Also, let's see here, front sight protector. Over here, you can see one on this long branch. Maybe, if I can get you there. <laughs> that would go stamped for a time. And, uh, and trigger guards. Sometimes the trigger guard would end up being stamped on these. You know, just little ways to save money. That one's machined. And then, of course, while they made those shortcuts in England, one thing they kept was the spring-loaded bolt release here for disassembly. But this would be done away with in 1942 by Long Branch and Savage. They would go to a simple notch in the receiver for disassembly. And also many of these guns would have a simple two position flip rear sight. Durable but not terribly useful. And then, of course, as the war would turn in favor of the Allies again, they would start to kind of add niceties back. And ultimately, they would produce over a million of these. In England, the number four Mark I would give way to the number four Mark II in 1949 which was just kind of a spit and polished peacetime version. It would have a higher grade of wooden furniture. One mechanical change, they would go to hanging the trigger off the receiver instead of the trigger guard to give a more consistent pull. They would also make sure these would all have the milled micrometer rear sights. They're placing old stamped and flippies. 
and many would be given the kind of a black paint sunkerite finish and the butt plates would be swapped out for brass. They did make new production number four Mark II's. They also upgraded number four Mark I's, naming them number four MK1 slash 2, and they would even upgrade number four Mark I stars as the number four MK1 slash 3. And they would conduct this through around 1955. It's also worth pointing out that Long Branch in Canada would not only keep on making the number four, they would keep on making the Mark I star pattern into the 50s. And so both Britain and Canada would be issuing these during the Korean War era. And again, both would be replaced by the FNFAL, the C1 in Canada and the L1A1 in England in 1957. That's kind of wrapping up a long history. A lot of times the number four kind of gets overshadowed by the number one Mark III, the SMLE. And kind of understandably so, the SMLE is just a classic. But aside from this being a little longer and heavier, it's a better rifle in most other ways. One thing I've always liked about the number four is the wood furniture is more durable. The, the SMLE furniture has a lot of small bits and bobs that can easily crack off. And uh, it just doesn't wear as well. This is a more durable gun. And uh, post-war versions like this tend to be very nicely finished out and done. A few little differences. You notice this has the uh, hole in the bolt handle. It's a little weight savings feature. You'll see that in jungle carbines. But then other versions like this... Do not. They're just solid. There's a lot of neat little differences in these. Some of them are just manufacturing. Some of them are shortcuts. For example, originally these had five groove rifling. During the war, some would be made with two groove rifling. Just, you know, save time. But needs must. Right, old chap? Like I said, I just had these out and figured, yeah, why not do an infield video? Haven't done a lot of bolt actions lately, so I hope you enjoyed them. Just kind of looking at them. A couple of these will be going to a new home soon, so I thought I'd lay them out just as a comparison. Anyway, greatly appreciate you tuning in. Please, if you have your own infield stories or want to share your own infield rifle, post in the comments below. And if you could, like, share, and subscribe. This is Misha. And we'll catch you very soon. Next time.